Hello and welcome back. Today what I want to talk about is the general structure of Never Engine and justify why I've made uh, certain decisions as to how things are set up and structured. Uh, two disclaimers before I start. First, this is not a tutorial. This is not a how do you build a rendering engine and it should not be taken as such. Uh, the second is that what I am doing, even though I work in the video game industry, is not representative of how video game engines work. Um, I have a different set of requirements from what video game engines do. Um, so, like, if, if your goal is to make uh, a game engine, like, it's great if this serves as an inspiration to you. There's definitely a lot of stuff that can be taken away from this into a game. But uh, take what I am making with a grain of salt because I may not be doing stuff uh, the correct way uh, if you look at it from the perspective of uh, video games. Um, the first thing at the bottom of the engine, uh, the lowest level, is the Vulcan layer. And this is, for example, one of the places where I diverge from common rendering engines. Normally, what you want to do is abstract away the um, rendering API. So in game engines and in, even in other engines, uh, at this step, you don't have a Vulkan layer. You have something like Unreal calls it an RHI for rendering hardware interface. Uh, where you take all of the common operations, like setting the uniforms, doing the draw calls, so on and so on, uh, you abstract all of that away into something that is API agnostic. The reason why I don't do that is because I want to expose as much Vulkan functionality as possible into the rest of the engine, things like enumerators, uh, image handles and whatnot, because I want to give as much control as possible over the low level. Like, it's not the same level of control that you would have with Vulkan, because otherwise I just get Vulkan on top of Vulkan and it would be tedious, but I do try to give as much as possible. And that forces me into coupling and marrying the API with the, the engine as much as possible. So this is this is backwards. Um, in most projects, you wouldn't want to do it this way. I want to do it this way. Aside from that, most of this is uh, very standard. Like, I just took uh, Vulkan and I grouped Vulkan functionality into pieces that made sense. So for example, the hardware interface has all of the physical device and the logical device and the instance. And if you don't know what those are, that is just the um, uh, software representation of your GPU. Um, I abstracted all of the memory allocation and the allocation. I abstracted uh, how to set up a pipeline. And if you don't know what a pipeline is, uh, it's essentially what tells the GPU, how it's supposed to handle a frame, like which kind of rasterization method it's going to do, how it's going to read uh, the vertices in the buffers, which buffers are supposed to be where, so on and so on and so on. Um, and yeah, like the rest is just relatively self-explanatory uh, wrappers and helpers around Vulkan. The other thing that is a little bit different is this auto-generated folder. Uh, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. On top of that, I have this um, layer. Uh, what this does is it takes the Vulkan layer and it makes the actual utilities out of it. So, for example, effects handles how to set up um, a frame, and I'll explain it in a little bit. Gallery stores all of your meshes and your textures, and the render target storage handles the um, essentially the the render buffers uh, like if you were doing the fair rendering for example uh, render target storage is where all of the g buffers would be stored um, now one thing about this the reason why this is called a gallery is actually because i don't like how software engineers called everything an er like everything is X, Y, proxy, manager, controller, handler. And that doesn't mean anything. 
Like if you name one thing an X handler, that's fine. But it usually comes to the point where like all of your classes are, are an X manager or an X controller. And it does the opposite rather than making your classes and functions descriptive. What it does is that you cannot make apart one thing from another. I have a hard rule of avoiding ER names as much as possible. I, I think that it's often better to make the name of your classes memorable versus descriptive. Uh, especially if they're big, like if they're at the center of your functionality. It's better if it's memorable than if it's descriptive. Because that's exactly what a name is. Like, we don't name things in real life. Like, a cop isn't a milk holder. A cop is a cop. You associate the, the descriptive name cop. Sorry, you associate the memorable name cop with a given functionality. Uh, I cannot locate myself in code bases where everything is an X manager and an X controller. Uh, I often forget what is what when it's the same pattern of naming conversions everywhere, which is why I tend to go into descriptive namings. The reason why I call this a gallery is because since it stores meshes and uh, textures, it's kind of like sculptures and paintings in an art gallery. So this is what I mean by memorable, right? Like I could have named these a uh, texture and uh, mesh handler or texture and mesh uh, manager. Or, but although that tells me what it is, if I put that in a context where everything else is also named that way, I'm not going to remember that like that's what it's supposed uh, to do. I mean, maybe with the texture and meshes, it's a little bit less abstract, so I would remember. Um, but in any case, what I mean by memorable is something like this, where I, I try to find a clever way to identify the functionality without explicitly putting it out. The nice thing about uh, these, these two sets of uh, files in particular Let's go to effects first. This is the hottest piece of code in my engine. I don't mean that by saying that it's really sexy and clean, although I think it is personally. I know that many of you are going to disagree. Um, I say it because this is what sets up uh, your render frame. Like everything eventually passes through here if you want to see anything. And it's one function. Like this one function is going to serialize your uniforms. This one function is going to uh, set up the rendering pipeline. It's going like it does pretty much everything and It's one function This is uh, what I really like about it The purpose of this is I didn't want to be manually configuring the pipeline every time uh, It's super tedious. I looked for ways of minimizing the amount of effort that I have to do every time that I make a new prototype. And this is uh, the culmination of all of that work. Uh, as everything with Never Engine, it is never done. Uh, I am sure that I will eventually find more edge cases that I haven't contemplated that I will need to adapt for. But for now, this works really well. And in a second, I'm going to show you how I actually use it. Uh, next for the gallery, this is another one of the scenes where I'm doing weird stuff. My gallery is not a template, yet it stores pretty much any data structure as long as that data structure is copy assignable. What this means is that it can store uh, any arbitrary structure that you give it. It can store the SDL vectors, it can store eigenvectors, it can store whatever the heck it is that you want to give it it will handle it and it will handle it just fine, provided two compromises. First, as I said, it has to be copy assignable. And the second thing is that you have to give me a function that takes in an any type, casts it, and then uh, returns um, the serialized version of the data. Uh, the reason for that is because if you are going to give me anything, then I don't know how the data is stored by definition. So I try to not force too many assumptions on the data that the user wants to use, because since this is for research, 
I don't know the life of the user. I don't know what they've been through. I don't know what their life is like. I don't know what kind of trauma they're carrying around. So I cannot pretend to push my ideology of what the best data structure to store meshes is onto them. Uh, I am very respectful of people's opinions that way, which is uh, why I, I made it this way. So presumably the user knows better than I do how the data must be serialized. So they have to do it for me. One restriction that I'm pushing in addition to that, that I'm working towards eliminating is that the buffer that they give me has to be interleaved. So if they have uh, the normals, the texture coordinates and the positions, they all have to go into the same buffer. They cannot give me three different buffers. Uh, I don't handle that yet. As I said, I am working towards uh, eliminating that problem but it is uh, a mildly challenging um, design problem and I haven't figured out a way that I'm fully satisfied yet, which is why the branch where I'm working on that hasn't been merged uh, into master. But this has actually been very helpful when making prototypes um, because Again, I don't have to think about how my data is going to go on the GPU. I don't have to reason about uh, the GPU at all. I design whatever data structure I want. And it has happened uh, that sometimes I am given um, third party libraries that I need for a given experiment or for a given paper that I'm trying to implement. And obviously those haven't been made specifically for my engine. I just write the one function uh, that extracts the information and passes it into the engine and the rendering works just fine. So I'm really happy with this. It has minimized the amount of cognitive load uh, that I have to handle whenever I'm coding. And I'm, I'm fairly satisfied with uh, how it turned out. So let me show you now, after this, by the way, uh, there's not much. There's some utility functions to like move the camera around, but those are not particularly exciting. Uh, and after that, like the library is essentially done. Uh, you just have to include it. Now, the way that I use both of those classes that I just show you are like this. This is how you actually do a render call. So you just have to give me um, the effect framework, which uh, is just uh, the state, essentially. Um, which uh, geometry buffer you're actually going to use for this, and this geometry buffer is extracted automatically by the gallery using uh, that technique that I explained before. So you don't really have to do much there. Uh, the name of the shader that you want to use, uh, if you want, you can pass arbitrary buffers and uh, textures if uh, your shader is using that and you pass in the uniforms and after each uniform you have to specify which binding location the uniform goes to which is another compromise that i've made but i think that this is very simple to memorize so it's not particularly hard on the user and it does simplify the design on the engine a lot which is why i went uh, with that uh, one thing about this, the first thing is if you saw the way that uh, the effects worked, those are a, a variadic template list. So you can give in any number of uniforms of any type of any kind and the angel is going to handle it. You can just, assuming that it's compatible with the shader, you can just write down the structure, pass it onto this, and it will work. Which is why I'm really happy with the state of the function. However, uh, if you remember that auto-generated the thing that I was talking about, I have kind of a love-hate relationship uh, with the auto-generated uh, file. What it is is, I have a Python script that runs during compilation and it goes and looks into the shaders, for example, in this one, and it looks for the uniform declarations. So it doesn't do anything with SSBOs. So it, it will ignore all of these, but it will look at the uniforms like these two, and it will create a header that has um, some metadata information about the structures and the structure definition itself, which makes it such that if you declare this, for example, it is going to show up 
on your C++ code. So you don't have to copy paste it and redefine it manually. It does it automatically. Uh, now that is great and it has been really helpful. The reason why it's a love-hate relationship is because it has to run before compilation. Um, and I don't like that because it's, it, uh, it restricts the use a lot. I would rather have it be dynamic. But the problem with having it be dynamic is that the only alternative that I can think of is creating C++ code that does all of this at runtime, like it does the parsing and so on at runtime, calls uh, a compiler under the hood, compiles a DLL library and then links into it. And I'm not really sure that that's that much better than what I'm doing. So yeah, this is this is another design problem that I'm trying to decide how I'm going to solve uh, and I don't have a good solution right now. And I have other worries, so I've been postponing it uh, while I develop other aspects of the engine. Because it, it works so far and it does what it's supposed to do, which is preventing the tedious uh, work of copy-pasting um, uniforms here and there. Um, the other thing about my shaders is that they have these comments. This is actually meaningful. This actually does stuff. It configures the rendering pipeline, and the reason why I did this is because I, when I'm writing a shader, I want to think about the shader as much as possible. I don't like doing context switching of GLSL to C++ just to set up my pipeline uh, when I want to do something. So this allows me to tell the engine, look, this is how this shader is supposed to be used. We are going to depth test. Uh, which means, you know, discard things when they're in front, uh, when they're behind other stuff. Uh, we're going to read the buffers in a triangle fashion. So every 3D makes a primitive. Um, the width of the line is going to be one and the field mode is going to be a line. And it could be field or it could be point or so on. So each one of these maps one to one with a Vulcan uh, uniform parameter. And the reason why I really like this is because, again, it reduces that cognitive load from doing context switching all the time, which allows me to just focus on the shader that I'm writing uh, rather than on uh, some tangentially related C++ code. So yeah, I'm, I'm also pretty happy about how this uh, sub part of the system uh, worked. Now, in terms of how all of these works together. Uh, you can see the basic uh, rendering is not that complicated. Taking into account that this is actually setting the full frame, like this is telling Vulcan uh, all of the values that it's supposed to set in the pipelines. It's um, creating the pipelines if it doesn't exist. It's loading the memory. It's allocating. All of that is done in this one thing, and it's actually fairly configurable. Um, the final thing uh, perhaps to mention is I use Premake for my compile, uh, for my build system. The reason why I'm not using CMake is because CMake is very convoluted to use. I don't understand half its syntax, whereas with Premake, I find Premake so much easier uh, to use. It's a lot more straightforward and because it's hooked onto Lua, it's also a lot more extensible. It's easier to find libraries for it and so on. So yeah, I'm a big advocate for Premake. At one point I might make uh, some CMake bindings to compile uh, to give people the option, but that's very, very far off um, into the future because I don't want to deal with CMake uh, right now. So yeah, uh, hopefully you found this interesting. Um, please let me know if you have any opinions about this, if uh, you think uh, that I glossed over certain things or whatnot. I could definitely make a video about anything that I forgot to talk about that you guys uh, consider interesting. Um, if not, thank you for watching. And uh, if you want more of this in the future, please consider giving it uh, a like and a subscribe.